Hello my beautiful hammerheads and welcome back to another Black Library review, part 36, Ariman Sorcerer, the second book in the Ariman series. And like the first one, I really enjoyed this one. Back then, when it was released, I did not finish the story, so it was basically my first time after the half, uh, after the first half of the book. <laughs> And yeah, it's great. Ariman's quest is just so humongous because he still wants, because uh, yeah, that's his drive. He wants to redeem himself and his legion because he's, yeah, well, he's mainly to blame for the dustening of the 15th legion and he wants to bring back every single one of his brothers. And that means sometimes killing one of his brothers. Yes, <laughs> sacrifices must be made. It has a little time jump in between the first and the second book. And I just discovered that there is a short story in between, uh, which explains the time gap. It's not really necessary as um, it really picks up in a good spot. I will still read it but <laughs> it's not possible for this review right now. So Ariman has his fleet, he has a great following and there are many original Thousand Suns and Rubricase behind him and many renegades so he has a really strong force but still his quest feels unreachable. With his powers now unlocking, he's still weak. He's not the strong Ariman as we know him right now. Because he got wounded in the first book and this was, oh I can't remember, it was either a silver grenade, so a grenade filled with, uh, filled with silver shards, or a silver bullet is stuck near his heart, so an Iron Man situation, and he holds the uh, silver shards with his psionic abilities in place so that it won't kill him. So every little psychic ability he uses is just draining him and he's quickly exhausted. But he's still powerful. So in this book he's looking for a very specific book, the Athenaeum of Callimachus, a book which apparently holds the thoughts of his father Magnus the Red and probably more of his secrets and dark thoughts. So yeah, it's a great book of knowledge. His following from the first book is also there, which made me really happy. So Carmenta, the uh, now Dark Mechanicum pilot, is back. Astrius, the former Imperial Space Marine librarian, is back. Astrius' demon-possessed brother is back. And Maroth is back. I love this. It's so great to see. But not only his allies are back because with chaos nothing is really an ally, everyone hates everyone. <laughs> there were three inquisitors in the first novel and they are back and they've brought support. Support in grey silver armor. The grey knights are there and I love this. These are my boys, the grey knights, against my Chaos Boys, the Thousand Suns, it is the perfect mix for me. But still, the most enjoyable part was the intrigue. The pacing was good. It wasn't too rushed, it wasn't too slow. Several factions in between the Chaos Worshippers tried to manipulate the whole quest to gain more power for themselves and to, yeah, well destroy Ariman and his ongoing stuff. 
All the while the Inquisition is of course trying to prevent everything and yeah well they are trying to kill Iron Man. <laughs> One of the things I really missed was funny stuff. I maybe there was something but it wasn't as much or in great as I wanted it to be. I can't remember even chuckling a little bit. I was shocked more and baffled by the let me call it jump scares in the story moments and after a time it just felt a little bit overwhelming because everything, uh, everything was dark, everything was just depressing and oh, it was this was one of my only gripes and this is a major one because everyone who follows my reviews knows I want at least one joke in a story. <laughs> one of the things I really really liked was the comparison of information gathering or the acquisition of information let me call it like this because the Inquisition and the Grey Knights were able to capture Astrias which is of course a shocking moment but Ariman and his followers were able to capture an Inquisitor um, and all this is of course <laughs> at the same time so we get a side-by-side -side comparison on how which faction gathers information or acquires the information. So the Inquisition this is pretty dark. They're basically, yeah, well, they're turning Astrius to a servo skull. They're trying to extract the information out of him this way so that he's talking without realizing. And this is pretty gruesome. Uh, all the while, Ariman has a far more humane kind to acquire the information in which he's just psychically invading the memories of the Inquisitor and he's not doing it really by force of course I won't spoil anything right now but he's not hurting her or something she's she's not even aware that he's there he's just someone in the background in her memories and he's just watching listening and yeah that's just him in her memories pretty stark differences <laughs> but the Imperium of Man they are the good guys <laughs> there are again some philosophical questions I can't remember who had the discussion with Iron Man I believe it was Carmenta because she's the only one who speaks her mind with him and she tells him, and I love this part, you are able to see so far, but you do not see the cliff in front of you. And this is so fitting for the whole story of the Thousand Sons. That is why I love them. They are so arrogant and they know so much. They can see into the future. So the Corvidae. Uh, can see into the future and but they do not see what is right in front of them they're making mistakes because they are unable to see it it's so tragic I love this there are many good quotes in this book as there are many good discussions one of the shocking moments oh when I think about it, it's, this was a little bit funny. One of Ironman's followers, he's one of the weaker psychers, has a servant because every one of the other psychers from the Thousand Sons, they don't need servants. They don't need slaves because they're just psychically unarmoring themselves, cleaning their armor and then putting it back again on their own. And he is not able to do this. So he invites his serf, gives him a cup of wine, 
talks a little bit to him and yeah well he's basically brainwashing him he tells him oh, I, i'm compared to my brothers i'm just a child with my powers they r really do not need me but then bam he wipes the memories of his servant and the servant is just stands there and it's just like why am i here this is not the first time I'm standing in the room of my master and I can't remember why he called me. Ah, well, let's clean up the spilled wine from the cup on the floor. <laughs> okay, this was great. <laughs> but still, this was kind of more shocking <laughs> than funny. It's just my dark humor that comes to shine in this moment. <laughs> and again, like with the first book, Zinch is only in the background. Machinations are only in the background. I love this. I don't know why I did not finish this book back then. I missed so much <laughs> because I couldn't remember anything of it or I wasn't able to recognize the stuff. But it's great. I love it. Of course, there are some shocking deaths, uh, mainly because Grey Knights are dying. <laughs> My boys! <laughs> but <laughs> this is also pretty amazing to see Grey Knights from the point of view from a Chaos Psyker, in which they're trying to, well, mortal wound <laughs> the Grey Knights, and then they're just like, oh no. And the description of the psychic defense of the Grey Knights is pure silver. I love this. Also, before I end this review, we have Carmenta's descent into madness and her realization why the Mechanicum of Mars is basically outlawing the merging with the machine. As I've said, she descends more and more into madness. And the more and more she descends there, she reverts back to her childhood self in which she sometimes calls out to her parents. And uh, we get more backstory for Astrius, which I really, really love. Astrius is such an amazing character. And I can't wait to read the third book or rather listen to <laughs> because Mark Elstub is an awesome narrator I love him sadly he was bullied out of the first Dawn of Fire novel but to be fair Jonathan Keeble is the better uh, narrator for Dawn of Fire Mark Elstub is more for chaos -y stuff and I don't have Deepkin. Court of the Blind King was also narrated by him. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad that I revisited the second book of Araman. I really, really enjoyed it. As I've said, there are flaws, sadly. But from my burn it to devour it scale, I give it a devour it if you are an Araman or Thousand Suns fan. And read it if you are a Chaos fan and want to know more about some machinations of the Changer of Ways with his favorite playthings. Oh, and before I forget, uh, in the first novel there were some space wolves, but there were just a footnote. Here there are space wolves who were hunting Araman since the burning of Prospero. They are old, but Basically, they were in the Eye of Terror, time dilation and stuff like that happened. They're not so old, but 10,000 years have passed since they've entered the Eye of Terror. So, they're a bit different. I don't know if I really like them. They were the other part, which I really did not enjoy. I like Space Wolves, but they were basically just tacked on. However, there is the foreshadowing that there will be the main enemy in the third book. I don't know. 
I have to see. But yeah, <laughs> all in all, I give this book a 9 out of 10 horrors in the warp. What are your thoughts about this story? Please leave your thoughts and questions in the comment section down below. I am keen to know what you have to say. And while you're down there, do all the YouTube stuff because hitting buttons is fun. Have a great day, my friend. Stay fantastic. Stay hydrated. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.